Hello and welcome to week two of National Myeloma Month. We would like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia. I am presenting today from the Dandenong Ranges on the land of the Wurundjeri people. We acknowledge their continuing connection to land, sea and community and we pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging and we extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people watching with us today. So glad to be here with you all. My name is Laura Jones and I'm one of the specialist myeloma nurses here with Myeloma Australia and I'm based in Victoria. I'm joined today by my co-host and fellow nurse Natasha Clark from sunny Queensland. What a huge National Myeloma Month we have had this year. I feel like every year it gets bigger and bigger. We began the month by raising essential awareness about myeloma and funds for our organisation at both the Greatest Walk, which was held across the country, and the longest lunch event here in Melbourne, which I was lucky enough to attend. We then spent some time during our first seminar focusing on advances in treatment and access to these treatments here in Australia. We do acknowledge that therapy brings challenges though, and that finding a balance between the therapy and their side effects is key. Brings us to our theme today. It's all about self-empowerment. We aim to outline the ways in which our organisation is focused on individualised support, as well as improve your understanding of how to best support yourself or your loved one and improve your quality of life with myeloma. We have some interesting presentations coming up for you. Um, you'll hear from both health professionals and from people who have lived with myeloma for many years. Today's seminar runs for about two and a half hours with a short five minute break scheduled between the second and the third sessions at about one o'clock Victorian time. Working behind the scenes today is our colleague Diana from New South Wales and there is also a nurse available on the support line if you're experiencing any technical difficulties. And just a reminder that number is 1800 693 566. Diana will be monitoring your questions which you can submit today by the Q&A box if you scroll down the page. This box cannot be seen if you are viewing today's session in full screen. We will do our best to respond to your questions today, but please include your email so that we can respond that way if required. You can also email your questions directly to our nurses at myloma.org.au email address. A reminder, today's session will be recorded and available for playback on our website, along with the session from earlier this month. We would love to know what you think about today and last week's session. Your feedback is appreciated so that we can tailor our future events to your needs. And you'll find the evaluation link at the bottom of the webpage. It should only take a couple of minutes to complete. So with all of our housekeeping out of the way, it's now my absolute pleasure to welcome our first presenter, Narelle Smith. Narelle is a senior myeloma nurse based in WA working with Myeloma Australia. With more than 20 years of cancer nursing experience in a variety of clinical research and project roles, both in Australia and overseas, she's been working with Myeloma Australia for six and a half years and up until recently was also working with the Cancer Network of WA as a haematology cancer nurse coordinator. She's always striving to improve cancer services and support available to people living with myeloma and their families and is heavily involved in a number of patient-centered projects here at Myeloma Australia. She's always eager to share these projects and the amazing work that Myeloma Australia does with the wider community, including at national and international conferences. Thank you so much for giving your time up today, Narelle, and welcome. Thanks, Laura. And hi, everyone. Thanks so much for the introduction. Um, and I'm coming to you guys this morning from sunny Perth in Wujuk, Noongar country over here in WA. It's only nine o'clock over here. So thanks, everyone, for joining us if you're here in the West too. So I help to cover the community and nursing programs, as Laura said, with Myeloma Australia, and I've been lucky enough to be involved in some of the amazing, amazing projects that we have, 
centred around improving support for people living with myeloma and their families in the time I've worked with Myeloma Australia, which is six and a half years. It's my absolute pleasure to share some of the projects with you today, not all of them because we've done so many, and to show you some of the programs that have come out of our projects that we've developed in the past few years. So a little rundown on who we are as Myeloma Australia, and I'm sure a lot of you know already, but it's always nice to have a look at, um, at what we're really about. So we, we are the only Australian myeloma specific not-for-profit organisation. We support, we educate, we inform, we empower the myeloma community, and we also raise community awareness we educate health professionals and we actively advocate for improved equity and access to treatments through people like the PBAC and MSAC. The past few years has seen a lot of changes in our organisation and I'm sure a lot of you have noticed some of them. We have a new brand that we launched earlier in March this year. We have a new CEO and we also have had some incredibly knowledgeable and caring new nurses join our team. We have a few more coming soon too. Excitingly, as an organisation, we are developing more awareness and gaining momentum through events such as My Greatest Walk, previously known as 38 Mate, and our ambassadorial program. We are a nurse-led organisation, as you've met quite a number of our nurses in this, um, in this series, and I'm one of them. And we have specialist myeloma nurses providing support and representation to all states and territories around the country. As a nursing group, we have some primary focus areas that we provide support through. And these include support, obviously, through our online and face-to-face -face information and support groups and our national telephone support line, which is available Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time and soon to be Eastern Standard Time after next weekend. Information through our information seminars, which are run both face-to-face -face and virtually like this one for National Myeloma Month, all recorded and available to watch on demand, and our written resources, which are available on our website. We have education uh, resources through our resources online and in hard copy format. We run information seminars, like I mentioned before, and we also provide education to health professionals through written resources, education events, ward in service, and presenting our findings and our projects at national and international conferences. We also participate and collaborate in research and I'll show you some of the research we've been involved with, as well as some of our publications today. All of our nurse-led programs are provided free of charge and they're open to anyone who's impacted by myeloma in the community. Last year, you may have seen in our communications that there was an opportunity to participate in the Myeloma Australia survey of patients and carers which surveyed 244 people living with myeloma and 51 carers of people living with myeloma impacted uh, in Australia. The survey was performed by an organisation called CAPRI, who have patient-centred research as one of their primary focuses. The survey was designed to understand the Australian myeloma community's preferences for our support services as an organisation, and also to understand people's access to myeloma treatments in Australia. The results of this study gave us some valuable insights that have highlighted some priorities for us for our future projects and guided our community-centred program development. Some of the main findings from this survey about our services are shown in that infographic there on the right of the slide. Uh, it highlighted that our telephone support line was our most valued service. It also highlighted that people prefer seminars like this to be run online rather, in, rather than in person and that in-person support groups, so our face-to-face -face support groups, were much more preferred than our online support groups, which we can understand. And obviously we ran the online support groups uh, as a priority during COVID, but things seem to be changing and we've, we understand that. So on this next slide, this is also from that same survey and it outlines the participants' experiences of being able to access myeloma treatments in Australia. Interestingly, two thirds of the participants 
uh, they reported that it was easy to access myeloma treatment in Australia, which is great. But it's also important to note that there were some difficulties experienced by participants and they were around uh, the distance that people needed to travel to see their treating team or to receive treatment. And this has certainly supported our movement towards regional, rural and remote outreach for the myeloma community in Australia. And I'm gonna talk more about that shortly. So that's one of our major projects. Importantly, in this survey, 45% of people felt that myeloma was not well understood by decision makers, but even less participants felt that their voice was heard by decision makers. And there was a belief by just over a quarter of participants that myeloma received less funding than other cancers in Australia. So I think this is a nice background to start from as I start to talk about some of our projects that we've done over the last few years. So let's have a look at some of them. This is not all of them. This is just, as I click my button multiple times, this is just a little snippet of some of the things that we've been working on. And I'm gonna talk about a few of them now with you. <clears throat> so the first program I wanna to talk to you about has been around for a few years now, and that's our Partners and Carers program. So this project started back in 2020, right at the start of COVID. So our specialist myeloma nurses were aware that partners and carers of people living with myeloma had unique and important support needs. We had previously held some information sessions that were specifically for partners and carers as breakout sessions in our face-to-face -face seminars. Some of you may have come along to some of them. But in 2020, we decided we wanted to understand those experiences more. And so we invited the Australian community of partners and carers of people living with myeloma to share their experiences with us. We developed a survey and invited partners and carers to complete it. And we had over 147 responses. We were blown away by this. We gained an insight into what it can be like to be a partner or a carer of someone living with myeloma, which was so valuable and so important. I still think about some of the responses that we received in that survey today, and it was four years ago. So you can see a word cloud that I've put at the top of this slide, and it shows some of the responses shared by participants in our survey about the feelings they experienced of being a partner or a carer of someone living with myeloma. So there's some pretty standout feelings expressed there. So the more times it was listed uh, as a feeling or an experience in the survey, it makes the words bigger. So you can certainly see some standout uh, words there that I'm sure a lot of people here identify with. And more than 70% of the people that we surveyed said that they would find a partner and care a specific support group useful. So we launched a pilot program about this and we ran it in two states to start with. One of them was WA and uh, we ran it over a period of a few months. And following the pilot, uh, we have then gone on to launch online and um, online partner and care specific support groups around the country. So there, you'll find them in most states and territories. Some of them are shared between two states, but we have some, some good attendance in those groups. We've also developed a carer resource toolkit, which we're going to put on our website, our new website when it's launched. It's, it's in development. I'll tell you a bit about that later. We've also had the opportunity to share our findings from this project with the greater community. And we presented a poster and it was at the International Myeloma Symposium in 2021 in Vienna. That was done virtually. We didn't travel there because the world was closed. And uh, we also presented it at the National Blood Conference the same year where we won the Best Nursing Poster Award. And I'm just gonna show you the poster now. Here it is. And the word cloud I showed you before is front and center in that, so it's so important. So if you're interested in joining a partner and carer support group, or you would like some support or information about our partners and carers program, please get in touch with us. We're more than happy to help you out. I'm gonna give you our contact details at the end. So another group of people that we have always supported as an organization are those living with smoldering or asymptomatic myeloma. These people are usually not on any active treatment, but they're being monitored at regular intervals by their haematologist and treating team. 
And that often can cause a lot of distress for people who are waiting for results on regular um, intervals, not knowing what those results are going to show. And the people in that group often find it hard to plan for the future. So we recognise that this group is unique. And initially, people living with smouldering myeloma were attending our other support groups. And some of them still do, but it doesn't suit everyone because the focus often of those myeloma support groups is on symptoms and side effects of treatment, which doesn't really apply in most cases of smouldering myeloma. So we did launch a national online smouldering myeloma support group. And these groups are still held online every quarter. We also have run an online information seminar about smouldering myeloma, which included an interactive Q&A session with an amazing haematologist. And this is available to watch back on our website as well. So if you're watching today and you have smouldering myeloma, or you would like to be connected to other people in the community living with or supporting someone with smouldering myeloma, please also get in touch with us and we can link you in with that community. It's an amazing community. Now onto our younger persons project. Uh, the average age of diagnosis for myeloma, I'm sure a lot of you know, is 65 years of age. And most of the time, when you ask someone to think about a younger person living with any kind of cancer, it's common to think about the adolescent and young adult age group of 15 to 25 years of age. But as we know, myeloma is unique in so many ways. And the uniqueness of it from an age point of view is that the younger people who get diagnosed with myeloma tend to be more in the 20 to 50 year old age group. So we're talking about people who often have young children, who have mortgages, who are trying to work or study, who have really busy, busy, busy lives and a lot of people depending on them. So for this project, we initially wanted to understand the younger person myeloma community so that we could develop some resources and support services specifically to support them better. So similar to the Partners and Carers project, we developed a survey that we sent out to our community and people falling into this age group of 20 to 50 years of age were encouraged to complete the survey. We received 105 responses to this survey and every state and territory had representation in the responses that we received. We wanted to understand who the younger people living with myeloma were, where they lived, were they regional, were they living in metro areas and what their support needs were. We wanted to hear some of their real world experiences. Some of the support needs that ended up being highlighted through uh, the survey and the participants' answers are listed there on the right of that slide. And it's obvious things that I kind of mentioned before that come into that age group, parenting, young children, navigating work, financial stresses around sick leave and mortgages, and also other treatment related considerations like uh, late effects of treatment. We really did receive some incredibly pow powerful insights into the experiences of younger people with myeloma. And I was lucky enough to present these results and share some of the programs we have since launched to the Cancer Nurses Society of Australia Winter Congress last year. And my colleague, Laura, who you met at the beginning of today, also presented these findings at the blood conference in Melbourne last year. So we've had some great exposure and it certainly generated some good discussions around this important group of people. I just wanna show you now on the next slide, some of the resources that we've developed as part of this project. So we were lucky enough to be recipients of a grant from GMAN, which is the Global Myeloma Action Network as part of the International Myeloma Foundation or the IMF. And from this, we were able to really grow our Younger Persons Program. We were able to increase our existing national online younger person support groups to monthly meetings where they were being run every three, three or so months before that. And we tend to have specialist guest speakers at most of these groups now. We were able to hold a younger person specific seminar online last year covering topics such as late effects of treatment, navigating relationship changes and financial security. The recording from this seminar is still available on our website, so I urge you to take a look if you haven't already. We also recorded some podcast episodes of, for younger people as part of our My Conversations podcasts, 
and we're always hoping to record some more of these in the future. So if you're interested in joining one of our younger person support groups, please get in touch with us for more details. And uh, also just to mention that when we launch our new website, there'll be a page on there with clickable links and resources for younger people living with myeloma as well. I'm really excited to share with you this next project, which is our Nurse Link project. Myeloma Australia currently has 13 specialist myeloma nurses working throughout Australia, and these nurses run all of our community-focused programs, including information and support groups, seminars, and health professional education. However, the majority of these nurses live in metropolitan areas, and we are aware that significant numbers of the myeloma community live in rural areas. We're actually estimating about 6,500 of the 22,000 people living with myeloma live regionally in Australia. We understand the importance of developing connections in these communities for us to be able to provide equitable services. And so we launched the NurseLink project to help improve regional and rural support by offering mentorship and education opportunities to regional haematology nurses. In the pilot, we recruited seven nurses and these nurses were experienced in haematology nursing with ranging of experience years of five to 20 plus years of haematology nursing. And we found that the, from the pilot, the NurseLink nurses were all very passionate about myeloma. That probably goes without saying. And they had a desire to raise awareness about myeloma and support people living with myeloma as best they could. And from the pilot, the outcomes were overwhelmingly positive. NurseLink nurses found they developed invaluable connections with other nurses through regular meetings and improved access to myeloma resources. Awareness about our services in regional areas was also greatly improved through this project. And you can see here the poster that was presented at the National Blood Conference a couple of years ago about this project. And in some exciting news, we've recently been successful in obtaining a grant from Pfizer to further expand our support to the regional, rural and remote myeloma community in Australia. And part of this project will be to expand the Nurse Link program over the, in the country for the next couple of years. So we, instead of just being down the East Coast, as you can see there, we have already recruited um, some nurses in other states and that will expand. So to increase our knowledge base in the lead up to applying for this grant, we surveyed the Australian myeloma community living in these remote regional and rural areas and we received over 180 submissions in response to this survey, which is incredible. And that found that respondents to the survey live between 50 and 1700 kilometres from their nearest capital city. And more than 50% of respondents reported needing to travel to a capital city to see a haematologist or receive treatment. Findings from this survey guided topics for our first ever Living with Myeloma in a Regional, Rural and Remote Setting online seminar last year with some amazing experts speaking about treating myeloma remotely, about teletrials and discussing some practical considerations for people living regionally. The feedback from this seminar was really positive and you can watch this back on our website. And we're really looking forward to sharing more about our regional connection and outreach from this project in the not too distant future. And this project, this is the poster here on the left of this slide that was presented at the National Blood Conference last year, showing the information we received from the Regional Rural and Remote Survey. We understand that Australia is culturally and linguistically diverse and the myeloma community within that is no different. Our culturally and linguistically diverse project is still only in its early stages, but so far we've developed a myeloma information sheets in a number of different languages, and you can find these on our website in the resources section. If you're looking for any information in a language that's not available, please get in touch with us and we'll endeavour to help you out. And the other service that we have added as an option to our telephone support line is that you're able to access an interpreter service as part of your call with us. If this is something that you would be interested in or you would like more information about, please get in touch with us and we can give you that information. There's also uh, information about this on our website and each of the info sheets in the different languages also gives that information about the interpreter service. So you can share that with your patients if you're a health professional watching today too. 
So talking more about our telephone support line, there's some new improvements, hopefully coming very soon to this service. We recognise that this is our most valuable service for the Australian myeloma community, but we're hoping to make it more streamlined and a much better quality service for you. So coming soon, you'll be able to use our booking system where you can go onto our website or call us on the same 1800 myeloma number and book a time convenient for you to have a call with one of our specialist myeloma nurses. This will be a pilot program and we'll be eager to hear what you think, but we certainly feel that it's going to allow us as nurses to provide more information and support with each call and that the system will be really user friendly. For now, the telephone support line continues as normal. However, we're hoping to launch the pilot for this in the next month or so. So please watch our website and communications for more information coming soon. As I mentioned earlier, we launched our new brand in March 2024, so the beginning of this month, to coincide with National Myeloma Month. We're working hard behind the scenes to roll out our new brand so you will start to see it on our banners our shirts and our resources in the very near future. And we thank you for your patience during this transitional stage. I just wanna to touch on our myeloma resources as we're currently always continuously actually working on improving and updating and developing new resources for you in the community. Last year, we released the all new comprehensive guide and you can see the front cover there, which has now gone to print with our new branding and I urge you to take a look if you haven't already. You can see an electronic copy on our website. So just head to the patient and care section on the website, click on resources and click on books and it's there to download. We of course have the culturally and linguistically diverse resources I mentioned earlier, and we're in the process of updating and writing new treatment fact sheets for some of the emerging treatments that are coming out. So there's one coming out soon about bispecific T-cell engages and we're also updating information sheets on nutrition, exercise, fatigue, living well. Uh, so keep an eye out for these on our website. You may have heard from us about Choice App, which is a smartphone or tablet app developed by Capri in consultation with us. And it's a shared decision-making app for people with myeloma. On the app, you are able to identify and reflect on your personal treatment priorities with an easy selection process. And then this will issue you with a summary of these priorities. You can print it out, you can save it as a PDF. And this can help you uh, in a number of ways. It can help you and your family prepare for your appointments. It can assist you to better communicate with your treating team or your haematologist. And as your priorities change over time, you're able to track those changes. So you can have a look back and see the history of, of what was important to you in the past and how you feel now. So the Choice app is open to anyone with myeloma and it's particularly beneficial uh, if you're recently diagnosed or if you're undergoing a change in treatment or just if you're looking to build confidence in your interactions with your treating team. It helps if you're comfortable with technology, but if you're willing to learn, there's a website with some frequently asked questions and there's a link to this app and information in our comprehensive guide. And our nurses are always available to help you. It's important to note that this app is not designed to select a treatment for you or anything like that. It's about guiding a shared conversation about your treatment goals with your treatment team. Uh, and Myeloma Australia and Capri adhere to strict policy privacy, privacy policies. Sorry, data is collected and stored securely in a protected environment in Australia, and personal details are never shared with any other parties. I'd like to quickly mention our Myeloma Impact Fund. Our goal is to raise ten million dollars per year for ten years to work towards making finding a cure and making a cure reality for people living with myeloma in Australia. In consultation with the myeloma experts in MSAG, our medical scientific advisory group, this fund will facilitate activities of impact in research, advocacy, education, supportive care, and through the development of practice statements. And you can read more about this on our website. 
Through our mailing lists and national newsletter, Myeloma Australia invites people to participate in a range of research activities. Myeloma Australia has demonstrated that they're effective in communicating, in connecting researchers in myeloma to those who are living with myeloma. And this research has been undertaken in various areas from potential new therapeutic targets and treating side effects from myeloma therapies to living well strategies and emotional support. We have demonstrated that participation in these research activities can be increased over other recruitment strategies by approaching the myeloma community through our communications, like our emails and things. So this has been particularly successful in South Australia. Since 2009, Myeloma Australia South Australia with the Myeloma Research Lab, which is now based at SAMRI, the South Australian Medical Health and Medical Research Institute, have conducted laboratory tours for the myeloma community. These collaborations have encouraged the effective connection of myeloma researchers and those living with myeloma. And that's something that will surely continue well into the future. Hopefully other states can roll out this amazing connection between researchers and the myeloma community. In Queensland, Myeloma Australia, together with the Heart Foundation, are supporting some regular volunteer-led walk and talk groups. These groups are currently held monthly and offer an opportunity for attendees to connect whilst also getting some gentle exercise, which can serve as a fresh option to attending a seated facilitated support group. So if you are keen to start your own walk and talk group where you live, please get in touch with your local specialist myeloma nurse, or you can contact us on the details at the end via the telephone support line or email us at the nurse's email. And we have so many more projects in the pipeline that we'll be able to share with you soon. At the top of the list is our website revamp. We've known for a while that our website is a little clunky and it can be pretty challenging to navigate to the information that you want to find. We know that we need a whole new design, but we're taking the time to do it right. We're working very hard to develop this new website, so it really will be the best it can be for you all. And we hope you can appreciate that this may take some time. So thanks for your patience. Our projects wouldn't have been possible without the support of the community and of course the grants that we've received in the past few years. We received a, a steadfast grant for the NurseLink pilot program. I mentioned GMAN earlier with our younger persons group. And finally, the Pfizer Quality Improvement Grant, which we will be using to continue to grow our regional, rural and remote project, expanding NurseLink and regional outreach to people living with myeloma. Finally, I really wanna reiterate that as an organisation, we value your support and your feedback and we want to empower you to be involved. We want to provide supports and develop programs that are worthwhile and useful. So please do get in touch with us if you feel that there's an area that we can give attention to or more support to in the myeloma community. We're really passionate about that. So here are our contact details. Remember, we have nurse representation in every state and territory too. So if you have a specific local query and want to be connected to your local specialist myeloma nurses, you can contact us on these details and we can link you in. And I'm not sure if I have any time for questions, but I'm more than happy to take some uh, if you have any. So thank you. Thank you so much, Narelle. That was an incredible summary of the amazing work that um, the organisation is doing. And also, I guess, as someone who's worked here as long as you have, what an amazing journey that we've been on. Um, Certainly. The one, one quick question before we get to um, hear from one of our Nurse Link nurses. Uh, it's from Angela, and she just wants to know, out of the 2,200 people we estimate are diagnosed with myeloma each um, yeah, how many of those do we feel like might be diagnosed with smouldering myeloma? That's a great question. Um, yeah. I'm actually, I would imagine that it's probably around the 20 to 25 percent mark, but I would be guessing. One of the I, know, I, I thought we, I think we might have to look it up. But you could yeah. probably find it on the um, Australian Institute of Health and Welfare website, um, yeah. Angela. But we can look at that figure for you and get back to you. I would certainly say that it's an area that we 
um, is poorly understood, actually. True um, statistics of all myeloma diagnosis are difficult to find in Australia. So that's something that we need to improve for sure. Mm -hmm. well, thank you so much again for your time. And thank you. um, we'll be hearing from Tash shortly. But first, a short clip from one of our um, very much valued uh, nurses, uh, Cindy Bryant, who works in the nursing role. Hi, my name is Cindy and I'm part of the Link Nurse Program for Myeloma Australia. The Link Nurse Program is a group of like-minded nurses who really want to bring the best possible care to their myeloma patients in rural and regional areas. Being a Link Nurse for me has given me access to a whole lot of um, information and expertise. Being involved with Myeloma Australia provides me with these resources that I can use to bring the best care to my patients. Rural patients often have to travel long distances to receive their care and they're willing to do this, but sometimes it's nice to be able to receive care closer to home. It's very exhausting and expensive to be constantly to and froing to their major centres, so to be able to have the resources and the expertise locally is of great value and really improves their quality of life. Hi everyone, I'm coming to you from sunny Queensland and from the lands of the Turrbal and Jagara people. This session I would like to introduce some really special people. Um, as health service providers, we know a lot about myeloma, but there really is nothing like the lived experience. So my next guests, uh, well and truly, um, into that, we have <clears throat> Wendy and Rod from New South Wales and Dom from South Australia. Um, I'd first like to introduce Wendy and Rod. Wendy is a myeloma patient who was diagnosed 50 years ago, in, uh, who, at 50 years, not 50 years ago, <laughs> in 2018, with extreme bony disease and quickly descended into kidney failure with a trip to ICU. So a pretty harsh introduction to myeloma. Wendy had induction therapy, a transplant and consolidation on thalidomide while living on opioid painkillers for many years with ongoing pain. Wendy had a great response to her therapy and is now living her best life 10 years on. She enjoys exercising, swimming and anything to do with the great outdoors. Wendy was diagnosed early into her relationship with partner Rod, who also joins us today. So my first question to you, Wendy, is, and Rod, what do you wish you knew at the start of your diagnosis? Well, good morning, everyone. Or oh, good afternoon, I should say. Um, what myeloma was, we had no idea. But I went, as you said, went from go to worry very quickly. So I was very unwell very, very quickly. Um, so it took, I couldn't comprehend what was actually happening to me because I went into intensive care. Um, Rod was my guide. He would ask my, we'd have a sheet of like a million questions um, to ask a specialist and he'd just shake his head every time he walked into the room. Um, yeah, but I think I, because it was a disease that was not well known, um, I just think it was, you know, knowing more about it at the time, what it was actually about. What do you think, Rod? I was mystified. Um... Initially, because I'd never heard of myeloma. And the head of haematology, who I was talking to, he was trying to get my head around a regime of medication that he had decided upon for Wendy to help address myeloma. And I had asked him innocently about the efficacy of the drugs, and he shrugged his shoulders. And I thought, well, hang on, you, you've you're the head of haematology and you've got a name for this disease. Tell me how you fix it. And he shrugged his shoulders again. And it turned out the efficacy was a whole lot less than 100%. It was something like 64%. We had a rather brutal exchange of opinions at that stage, but he reminded me that about eight years previous, no one, absolutely no one survived this cancer. I don't know how well 
prepared I would be if I'd known that in advance. It's probably a good idea that I didn't. Um, but I came as quite a shock. We were, were not guinea pigs, but there had been some successes, but there'd been an awful lot of failures as well. Hmm. Um, I think what I'd learned rather quickly um, was there are no guarantees. Yeah. And today there are no guarantees. We're making progress, but despite that, we just get on with it. Yeah, thank you very much for that. And I think that is reflected in the greater community and it's something that we hear a lot. And at Myeloma Australia, we are trying to spread the word and build up awareness so that people aren't experiencing something they've never heard of before, at least. Um, and then also improving those answers that the haematologist can give people when they're asked that question. So thank you, Wendy and Rod. Now I'd like to introduce Dom Scaleri. Dom was diagnosed with myeloma on the 1st of November 2014 at age 59. And this is his also his 10th anniversary since diagnosis. He had a transplant in 2015, after which he entered a clinical trial on exazomib, which was very successful. He had six years off myeloma therapy. Unfortunately for Dom, one health problem wasn't enough, and he encountered some various surgeries for an oncocytoma on his kidney and meningioma in his brain, both benign tumours but can be tenacious. Dom's myeloma relapsed in 2021 when he can commenced BCDD and is currently on lenalidomide and dexamethasone. Dom is remarkable because through all of this, he has been both patient and carer. He only lives with Rocky, his Maltese Yorkshire Terrier, who thinks he's a German Shepherd. Dom has one child, a son, who lives in Mount Nelson in Tasmania, and he is the eldest of five children, four sisters, and his mum, who's just turned 90, is still with us. Dom feels fortunate to still be able to work as a project manager for Airbus, who are a very supportive employer. He enjoys gardening, doing jigsaw puzzles, walking Rocky, and when able to, he adventures with his son in ta the Tasmanian wilderness, which sounds beautiful. Um, Dom, I'm going to ask you the same question. What do you wish you knew at the when you were diagnosed? Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and um, thanks for the opportunity to... Um to invite, to invite me to share my experiences. Uh, pretty well much the same as um, uh, as uh, Wendy. Um, it um, I had no idea what myeloma was, and it took um, oh, at least nine months um, before I was actually diagnosed with it. It was just constant going to different doctors. I knew I wasn't well, but you got the usual story, uh, too much gardening, um, do physio, all that type of thing. And I'm surprised I didn't break any bones because I was actually put on a rack and stretched in one of the sessions. Um, but eventually uh, they did a um, uh, an X-ray, a spinal X-ray, and I got a phone call from the doctor and he said, oh, he said, when were you in a car accident? And I said, what car accident? And he said, oh, he said, we found a whole pile of thoracic crush fractures. So from there, we went on, did some further testing. Paraprotein was through the roof and, and they finally said, well, you've got myeloma. And I thought to myself, what the hell is myeloma? I had never heard of it. Um, so it was interesting because my initial reaction was um, was a sense of relief to some some degree because finally I had a name to why I was feeling so bad. Um, and and I took it on myself um, to pretty well took control, um, took ownership of um, of my disease. Um, and being a project manager, it was ideal to set it up as a project, and that's how I've been running it for the last 10 years. It is my project. Um, I use the same principles as what I do on my normal job, and, and I track and um, all my results and, and um, prepare my questions for the various specialists. So I've thought about what would have what would have I liked at the time of um, of diagnosis. Probably just a, a simple one pager to say, well, this is what myeloma is about. Um, and maybe a, a couple of links. This, this is where you can get information. And now it's an area where I think you need to be pretty careful because um, uh, the when you when you get a diagnosis of cancer, it is such a shock not only to yourself but um, to your family and friends. 
And the last thing you want to do is inundate people with, um, you know, with a trailer load of, of information. Some people just take time to absorb that they've even got cancer, let alone want to start trawling through tons of information. But for me, just a simple one pager would have been terrific. So this is what my life is about. Um, and and then here's a, a few links because it does change as you go through your treatment. So, you know, through the different phases, um, you need different information. You see different specialists. So you, I don't think you can just give everyone a, a whole pile of information and say, well, this is what you're going to expect because it is different for everybody. That's one of the most surprising things I found with, uh, with myeloma um, is that it, it hits everyone differently. Um, I was really surprised when the first support group meeting I went to, there was a number of us that were diagnosed roughly in the same uh, the same uh, year, but were also different. Our, not only were our treatments different, but our side effects were were vastly different. And and you know, some how I felt and how others felt, it, it was just incredible. No two people were alike. Right. You know, it's, um, it's been been like that ever since. It's been quite an interesting journey. I really didn't expect to live 10 years, to be honest. Um, you know, originally, basically, uh, a hematologist said, well, he said, you, you might be lucky and get five or six years. You know, yeah, um, yeah, it was interesting. Mm. Really interesting. Thanks, Dom. And you've given some really good insight and tips on how to manage this disease and particularly being by yourself. So thank you very much for that. Other really important people in this space is carers. And um, and as Narelle alluded to in her session, um, sometimes carers get forgotten because we're focusing on the person with myeloma. So Rod, I'd like to um, talk a little bit about your experience and what things you found the most helpful as a carer. I had to rely on the advice of the nursing staff and um, social workers and supporting crew at the hospital because they knew more about myeloma than I did. They were hesitant to tell me what I wanted to hear, like is there a fix and how long does it take? And most of the answers were it depends on the individual. And I'm thinking I'm not getting anywhere here. But I've learned to accommodate that now. What's been most, I think we were actively encouraged, if I can put those two words together, to be very positive about it. We're very grateful that we can just survive each day as it comes. Um, we have plans to do lots of things. Um, at the moment, we have a small mortgage, so we're both working, and Wendy manages to do that too, and I'm very proud that she can. We um, exercise. Um, we exercise a lot. Um, exercise has meant Wendy has been able to strengthen her back. Um, her back was in much the same situation as Dom's was. Uh, she has many wedge fractures. In fact, she has a distorted sternum um, that went undiagnosed for a long time until we saw a profile X-ray and it had buckled as well. Um, but she's managed to get off all her painkillers. Um, the painkillers were dreadful things. Um, calling them painkillers kind of gives uh, some legitimacy to using narcotics and opioids. And um, she was put on fentanyl patches. Uh, um, the word patches sounds more accommodating than narcotics, but it's the same thing. I'm pleased to say she doesn't use any of those anymore. And exercise has been a terrific boost to us, to her mentality. Um, very good for a head as well as a body. We, there's many things we didn't understand very well. There was an awful lot of people who would take the time to tell us more about it. Um, we're very much aware that um, uh, plans to eradicate myeloma in their infancy, um, we, know, we know there's a lot of research coming. There's been an awful lot of failures in the research program, but we are making we are making small progress. I'm I'm really proud as a carer to be part of that information flow because I just couldn't sit back and twiddle my thumbs and bring her cups of tea and stuff. 
I couldn't do that. Uh, I, he does that anyway. <laughs> I, would, I would leave the hospital and go home and sit in front of Google all night and try and find out what was happening to Wendy. And oddly enough, there were no answers there either. <laughs> and it was a pretty volatile journey. Yeah. Thanks, Rod. You gave great insight into how it is for a carer. And I think many, many people will say the same thing. And you're also echoing the thoughts of the patients themselves as well. So I think um, it is a, a scary time and it's, yes. it's difficult. It's difficult not having a clear vision forward. Of it is. I felt so useless. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure you weren't. <laughs> Definitely was. <laughs> but then when I got a little bit stronger and it was like, I can do that, I can do that, then he did feel a little bit useless because he really <laughs> got him to the routine of doing everything. Yeah. Yeah. Looking after me. And it's like, no, I can do that now. <laughs> and he just didn't know how to. So the beautiful social workers at the hospital had a nice chat to him. Gave me a slap. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Uh, so I guess I um would like to ask, and I'll kick with you, Wendy and Ron. Um, how has your community coped with understanding your disease? Um, they've supported us and, uh, you know, we've, family and friends have been very supportive. Um, we've, you know, along the way explained things. Um, I'm involved in the, you know, the support group and we have our movie nights and friends and family come to that and support that. But I don't think they really understand still what my labour is and, like, you know, to an extent, you know, a lot of us don't know everything about it anyway. Um but we have had great people just wrap their arms around us. Staff at the hospital, look, they're just amazing. You know, and would come back to us like after the haematologist had been and then sort of toddled in behind, you know, 10 minutes later and explain to us in terms that we could understand a lot better as to yes. what was, you know, what was happening. But, you know, family and friends have been brilliant. We've got a really good support network. Um, you know, that it's allowed us to carry on and, and do things. So, yeah, no, it's been good. What do you think? Right. I think both of us have a fear of a relapse. Yeah. Because we know it happens and we hope it doesn't. Um, but I don't think our immediate community, our families, would know what to do or, or, or expect a relapse. Um, we put that in the back of our mind. Yeah. Yeah. So I might throw that over to else. Dom. Because um, yeah. Dom, you have experienced relapse. So how yes. has your community, your family taken that? Right. Um, so family was interesting. Um, there is a certain stigma about getting cancer. And um, I don't think that stigma has changed to millennia. It's um, you know, It was there when it was first diagnosed back in... Uh, you know, when time began, basically. So I'm guarded with what I say to the family because it's something that is not spoken about. They won't even mention cancer at home uh, with the family. Um, so I'm pretty guarded what uh, what I say to them. Friends were a little bit different. When I was initially diagnosed with, uh, with cancer, I was quite surprised by the reaction I got from friends. A lot of people just disappeared. You weren't invited out to functions. So I've now got uh, a very close knit uh, group of friends. You soon find out who your true friends are, believe me, when, you, when you, you're given a diagnosis like this. Um, but more importantly, uh, my support community is exceptional. I've, I've got an absolutely fabulous medical team. Um, so, you know, amazing haematologist that we've got um, great support nurses here. We've got Joe Gardner and Sophie Wilson at the RA, absolutely brilliant. Um, and um, and all my other specialists, as I said, I've, I've built up over the years, I've built up quite a strong medical team, uh, not just on, on the myeloma side, because I see this as a holistic, uh, I've taken it as a holistic approach. So, you know, it, it's things, um, exercise, nutrition, um, you know, your mental health, um, connecting, connecting with, um, with others. Um, 
So certainly the support from what I call the um, uh, my my Loma community team has been absolutely fabulous, even through the relapses. Um, I must admit uh, the last probably 12 to 18 months uh, has been a lot more difficult on the on the mental health side. Um, I've always been a half glass full person and, and really pretty well embraced that I'm living with a disease. I've got to live as well as possible. Um, but um, but mentally, I did hit a wall about 18 months ago, and I was, and after particularly uh, when my when I relapsed and that treatment uh, stopped after about just under 12 months, I think, and I had to find something else. I started thinking to myself, well, is it all worth it? Because it you know it is a hell of a strain. You you, you need such strong mental resilience because it's just at you constantly. Um, you know, apart from all the appointments you you got um, you have to go to, there's the the regular blood testing, but there's also the impact that has to to your other health issues. And and uh, I don't mind being a lab rat, but um, but one of the disadvantages of being a lab rat, particularly with me, they keep finding things. So they're not my loma related. Oh. So I've, I've got a list as long as my mom that I have to monitor. But you you take that in your stride, and and my team has built built up around that. So um, yeah, and. And, and there has been some good success stories. And um, for those who are on dexamethasone, I mean, I hate that with a vengeance. It, it just doesn't agree with me one bit. But um, I, I'm a great believer in in, um, in improving the gut biome because I'm pretty sure that if you get your gut biome right, that it will help with uh, with um, your medication. Exercise is definitely um, uh, beneficial. But um, I've been working with the nutrition nutritionist for the last uh, probably three months or so and my blood glucose levels have gone from the mid 20s down to 13 on my dex days which is just fantastic um, and that's through having a look at um, uh, on those days modifying my eating plan um, and 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 nutritionist was willing to think outside the square um, and look at the treatment that I was on not only for myeloma but all my other health issues and build an eating program around that and uh, the results have been quite promising. Mm. But yeah, certainly my own community, uh, my medical team uh, are just just fantastic. Yeah. Mm. That's great. It's great to hear. And um, your discussion about diet and nutrition leads really well into the, our, session, our session that we'll have after the break. But I'm also hearing from you both that you um, are... Um, both really into exercise and looking after yourself. And there's a lot of um, research coming out now about how much better outcomes people who are active um, and exercise regularly and have um, good exercise programs designed for themselves can also improve outcomes. And I think, you know, the fact that you have lived for 10 years and, you know, will continue to, to grow um, that that bears that out. Um, so thank you, um, Wendy and Rod and Dom for coming and sharing your stories. It's really valuable. And um, I think our community would have got some great tips from the three of you to help them in their journey forward. We're now going to share a short video um, from a app called Gather My Crew um, that is about gathering people's communities to help them through um, traumatic experiences like a diagnosis of myeloma. We will then have a short break for five minutes uh, before we move into our afternoon session. So bye for now. Thank you. Bye, Tash. Bye, Dom. Bye. 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 I've seen so many situations where people going through something awful had more help in their lives than they realised, but they just weren't able to activate it and turn it into something meaningful. And what we're trying to do with Gather My Crew is change the way people ask for help and change the way people offer help so that that doesn't happen. So that no matter what you're going through, you can be surrounded by and supported by people providing the right help at the right time to get you through.
hope you all have enjoyed um, our earlier sessions today and have had some time to grab a cup of tea. Um, I'm very excited to welcome our next presenter, Dr. Nicole Kitts, who will be presenting on using diet as medicine. Um, so Associate Professor Nicole Kiss is an advanced practicing dietitian with more than 20 years experience in cancer nutrition, including clinical research and allied health service management positions. She is a clinical associate professor and Victorian Cancer Agency Clinical Research Fellow in the Institute for Physical Activity and Nutrition at Deakin University. Um, as, and also co-leads the Exercise and Nutrition for Cancer Research Group. Nicole's research interests include interventions to optimize nutritional and functional outcomes during and after cancer therapy, with a particular focus on body composition. So thank you again for joining us, Nicole, and over to you. Thanks, Laura, and, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. It's a real pleasure to be able to um, join uh, you, especially for, for my awareness month as well. Um, so what I've been asked to present to you today about is using diet as medicine. So what I wanted to touch on first is the, the different focuses we have for nutrition, depending on which stage you are at in your cancer journey. So there's a very different focus uh, for nutrition when you're going through treatment and particularly in that immediate recovery period following treatment, as opposed to what you might do longer term for your health. So during treatment and recovery, our main focus is really on preventing the development of malnutrition and muscle loss, uh, while managing symptoms that are affecting your food intake to really help you optimise what you're able to eat. Whereas when we're looking more in the longer term health, uh, what we're aiming to do then is, is like we do for, um, for anyone in the population is really about aiming for healthy weight and reducing your risk of chronic disease. So what I'm going to focus on today in the presentation is during treatment and recovery. And we're really going to talk a bit about malnutrition and muscle loss, what they are, how you can recognise if you have them, what you can do about it, and also how to manage some of the symptoms you have that might be affecting your ability to eat um, enough nutrition. So before we go much further, I wanted to just tell you a little bit more about what I'm actually referring to when I say malnutrition or muscle loss or low muscle mass. So when we're talking about malnutrition, this means uh, particularly an unintentional loss of weight, loss of muscle, and also uh, loss of subcutaneous body fat that can occur alongside a reduced food intake. And while loss of muscle is a component or a part of malnutrition, low muscle mass itself is when you have an overall body muscle mass that's lower than average for your age and sex. So what actually causes malnutrition and low muscle mass? And these are multifactorial uh, things that can occur while you're going through cancer treatment. So one of the, the main things that can contribute to it is that during the treatment, because of the stresses on your body from going through the cancer treatment, you actually need more energy and protein than you normally would. So uh, if, even if you're eating your normal amount at the moment, it may not be enough for you and may lead to unintentional weight loss or muscle loss. Also symptoms that are affecting your food intake. So um, most of you will be well aware that uh, the cancer treatments can come with a, a wide range of symptoms such as nausea, and vomiting, a loss of appetite that can really make it very challenging to be able to eat uh, what you would normally be eating. Metabolic changes as well can occur where perhaps the nutrients that you're eating are not utilised quite as efficiently by your body as they normally would be. And the other component is can be physical inactivity and um, it might not necessarily affect everybody but the fatigue that can come along with treatment as well as the numerous appointments and, and everything else that you're dealing with can really make it difficult to maintain any physical activity. So does this matter? Does it matter if you have malnutrition or develop malnutrition or low muscle mass? And what I wanted to just talk through with you is that there are some uh, factors that can definitely um, 
lead to poorer outcomes. But we will then talk about uh, how you can reduce this and, and improve um, your uh, nutritional status and, and muscle mass as well. So having malnutrition or low muscle mass can lead to more severe treatment side effects. It can also lead to a poorer quality of life, make it harder to, to get through treatment, can also lead to a weaker immune system. And obviously that's something that's extremely important while you're going through your treatment. It can lead to a longer time for wounds to heal, which can be particularly important after going through any surgery. And it can lead to a longer time spent in hospital uh, just because of the time taken to recover and can also be associated with poorer survival. So it is obviously extremely important that we recognise malnutrition and muscle loss early and we intervene to minimise uh, the impact that it can have. One of the things that's really important and I really want to um, point out to you as well, and I think is not even necessarily very well recognised um, by all health professionals as well still, um, but you don't need to be visibly underweight to be malnourished. So there can be this perception that malnutrition is someone who is extremely underweight. Malnutrition can actually be present in anyone of any body shape or size. And the, the graph that you can see here on the screen is from a, a large study that we've done here in Victoria uh, across most Victorian cancer services where we looked at the prevalence of malnutrition. And what you can see is although the highest prevalence is in people who are considered underweight, one in every six person who was overweight or obese was malnourished as well. So it's really important to understand that um, it can occur in anybody. And one of the reasons for this is that underlying muscle loss can be occurring or present um, without you actually losing overall weight. So that's something that um, is important to understand. And that muscle loss can often be hidden, um, particularly and can be really quite hard for your health professional to notice. So what are some of the ways that you can recognise malnutrition and muscle loss? Uh, so some of the symptoms or signs that you might notice are if you've lost weight without meaning to, so perhaps your clothes or your jewellery feels looser than it normally does, you might be eating a bit less than normal, you might be experiencing a loss of energy or feelings of fatigue, you might have noticed a reduction in the size of your muscles, particularly uh, in the arms and legs. Now, each of these individually may not be um, a reason, may not point to malnutrition being present, but it's really important to um, understand that it could be and to look at identifying whether you might be at risk of malnutrition and then um, getting referred or getting access to some nutritional help to help you um, deal with this. One of the um, ways we look at whether you might be at risk of malnutrition is using something called the malnutrition screening tool. And I've got a web link there on the screen as well. This is a, um, a, a freely available tool um, that you can use through the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre website. And the malnutrition screening tool they have is a web-based tool there where you can actually um, look at your risk of malnutrition and it's available in up to 10 different languages other than English. Uh, it really asks you a couple of questions about whether you've experienced any weight loss recently, if you have, how much you've lost and whether you're having any difficulties with uh, appetite or food intake. And the output of that tool will then tell you whether you could be at risk of malnutrition or not and give you some um, suggestions of where you can then go on to find some help. So that's what I wanted to talk more about now as well, is what can you actually do about it? So if you are at risk of malnutrition or you've been told you have malnutrition or muscle loss, there's a number of different things we can do. So symptom management is one of the big ones, um, optimising your nutritional intake and being physically as active as possible. And I'm going to go through each of these now um, in a little bit more detail. So if we look at optimising nutritional intake first. So often people will ask, do they need to change what they're eating um, if they're going through cancer treatment or if they have a cancer diagnosis? There isn't any particular diet that we recommend for you um, while you're going through treatment. Uh, so 
typically if your appetite is not changed, if you're not really experiencing any symptoms that might be affecting your food intake, if you haven't lost any weight without trying, then just focusing on good sources of energy and protein might be all you need to do to try and keep yourself as fit and, and as well nourished as possible as you're going through treatment. But it is important to remember that your energy and protein needs are likely to be higher while you're going through treatment and in that immediate recovery phase. So when we talk about um, your energy needs, as I said, the, um, your energy needs are a bit higher than they are normally while you're going through treatment and, and recovery. So if you're aiming to present, um, prevent cancer-related malnutrition or muscle loss while you're going through treatment, we recommend aiming for an energy intake of around about 125 kilojoules for each kilogram of, and that should say body weight, sorry, um, meaning that if you weigh 70 kilograms, that is around about an intake of just, just under 9,000 kilojoules. But what's really important to remember as well is that this is just an estimate. So you do also need to check if you are losing weight, uh, then what that really means is that you're not actually eating enough to maintain your weight at that time. So it's a sign that you do need a little bit more. So some of the food sources of energy, and I'm sorry, hopefully this is not too basic for some of you, um, but carbohydrate foods, so bread, pasta, noodles, rice, and other grains, and particularly healthy fats are really good sources of energy. So fats um, are a more energy dense source of nutrients than carbohydrates and protein. So it's particularly helpful if you're losing weight, but you're struggling to eat more. It's a way of getting in more energy in a smaller amount. So when we're talking about healthy fats, we're talking about things like full cream dairy foods. We're talking about olive oil. So you can use extra when you're cooking, drizzle more over salads and vegetables to really just add some extra energy to your foods. Avocado, nut butters, seeds and nuts are also really good healthy fat sources. Sometimes, though, these types of foods can be really hard to eat if you're not feeling particularly well. So if you are really looking to put more energy into your diet, using other things like creams and ice cream and, and uh, other fat sources that we typically wouldn't say are as healthy, that's really important uh, way of, or a strategy to improve your energy intake if you need to as well. So protein needs, uh, again, should be really aiming to prevent becoming malnourished or losing muscle, aiming for somewhere between one to one and a half grams of protein for each kilogram of your body weight. So if we use the similar example of a person who's 70 kilograms, we're looking at somewhere between 70 to 105 grams of protein per day. Um, and I'll show you a resource in a moment where you can work out um, what sort of protein amount is in various different foods. So what's really important is to try and include a source of protein at each of your meals and snacks if you can. And protein, again, hopefully not too basic for some of you, um, but meat, poultry, seafood, eggs, dairy foods, soy-based products, legumes, nut butters and nuts and seeds are all sources of protein. So if you're losing weight or you've got signs of muscle loss and your appetite is low in particular, prioritising eating those protein sources at your meals and snacks is really important to help prevent muscle loss in particular. And the link I've provided there on the screen will provide you um, with an information sheet that does actually have various sources of foods and how much protein they contain if you would like to really look at your own protein intake. So we're going to move on then to the next thing, which is managing symptoms. And so obviously um, optimising your nutritional intake is extremely important in preventing malnutrition or preventing muscle loss. But that can be really hard if you're experiencing symptoms that are affecting your ability to eat. So that's the other aspect of really trying to um, support your, your nutritional status and nutritional health. So if we look at nausea and vomiting, first of all, so this is a symptom that's commonly associated with a, a number of different chemotherapy drugs. And besides treatment, there are a number of other risk factors um, that put you at slightly higher risk of experiencing nausea in particular. So being female, uh, being a younger age, 
if you are a, or have been susceptible to motion sickness uh, normal, normally, um, if you have psychosocial issues such as anxiety or if you have had previous chemotherapy treatment and found yourself um, to experience nausea during those times. And what we've found is that with modern antiemetics, we've um, really been able to improve the um, prevalence of people who are being affected by vomiting with now less than 20% of people being affected by that from their chemotherapy. But nausea is still affecting up to 60% of people who are treated with chemotherapy and has a really significant impact on ability to eat. So obviously we know that nausea and vomiting can have lead to malnutrition because obviously it's you um, might not be uh, keeping down the food and then can't actually benefit from those nutrients but it can also have an indirect effect on your food intake where you don't actually want to eat because of the the nausea that can be induced by that that thought of food so some of the things that we suggest doing uh, there's some meal modification strategies that can help so things like particularly spicy and fatty foods can sometimes make nausea worse um, having flavoured cold or warm drinks and foods can be um, easier to, to manage. So drinking cold, clear fluids between meals, you might have heard people talk about ginger ale um, in particular, fruit juices, lemonades, things like that. Um, make sure that when you're eating that you are choosing foods that you know you've tolerated well previously, and particularly things that might have neutral odours if you find that the smell of food is something that really triggers your nausea, um, avoiding unpleasant food textures, and often dry foods like toast, crackers and cereals can be really helpful. There's also some behaviour related strategies that can help as well. So eating slowly, so you're not overloading your stomach. Um, again, a similar kind of strategy by having small frequent meals. So perhaps instead of eating three meals per day, you might want to eat small meals every couple of hours or just a very small snack every couple of hours. And it's also really important to avoid skipping meals. So we know that um, having an empty stomach, sorry, excuse me, can also um, induce a feeling of nausea as well. So making sure um, as much as possible you can have small meals frequently to avoid that empty stomach feeling. Uh, avoiding overeating though, obviously um, you don't want to become too full either. And then some lifestyle and environment related strategies can be keeping away from the kitchen when meals are being prepared, particularly if you find that the smell of food is something that triggers your nausea or vomiting. Um, being in a pleasant and a nice environment while you're eating uh, can make that a more enjoyable experience. Uh, avoiding strong odours, things like perfumes and cleaning products, which could also make you feel nauseated, not just the, the smell of food, um, and undertaking activities that can help distract you from the nausea as well. And a couple of examples there are um, a, a exercise or hobbies. Uh, the next symptom that I wanted to talk through is mucositis, or uh, also known as having ulcers in your mouth or gut. And this is commonly associated with some chemotherapy agents as well, but particularly with stem cell transplant conditioning regimes that include melphalan. And it can affect up to 85% of people who are treated with a stem cell transplant. And the really important things for management include having good oral hygiene, using topical anaesthetic mouthwashes, and really importantly, analgesic agents. So something that can really control that pain as much as possible um, will al allow you to be more likely to be able to eat. So this has a pretty obvious effect on your nutritional intake as well. So if it's painful to eat, obviously that's going to lead to a reduced food intake. So that's where it's so important to be working with your, your um, treating team to make sure that the pain is managed as well as possible. In terms of your diet, then the strategies um, that we usually suggest are trying to have soft foods, bland foods, and things that are particularly high in energy and protein. So some examples I've put there are things like yogurt and smoothies. Mincing or mashing or pureeing foods like meats and fruits and vegetables can also be really helpful so that smooth texture is much easier to manage if you've got ulcerated mouth. 
And at foods that are at cold or room temperature also. So hot foods tend to be much harder to manage when you've got ulcers. Things like alcohol and foods that are hot or spicy can also um, irritate the, the ulcers. And as same with acidic foods such as citrus, fruits and drinks, um, and likewise with hard foods like crackers and nuts. So avoiding those types of things, having as smooth food as possible and things that are relatively bland. Then dysusia or taste changes is another very common symptom that can be experienced. And this is quite often seen following a stem cell transplant. And it can affect up to 70% of people who are going through cancer treatment and can be really challenging to deal with. Um, if food doesn't taste the way it used to, it takes a lot of the enjoyment out of it and can make eating a real chore. There is a little bit of confusion about whether the if the, what you're experiencing is actually changes to your taste per se or whether it's changes to other senses like smell and touch, which could actually be affecting the flavour of food as well. And they're two different concepts. So if you are experiencing difficulty or you're finding that things are not tasting the way they used to, it's important to work with a dietitian if you can to really identify which component of that might be affecting you and then get some strategies to help you deal with that as best as possible. What we tend to find is when you're having taste changes as a consequence of chemotherapy treatment, there's a real cyclical effect where the taste changes will develop shortly after the chemotherapy treatment, recover, and then as you have another cycle of chemotherapy, you go through that same process again. Whereas with radiotherapy, it's a much more cumulative effect where you might start with very mild taste changes and as the course of radiotherapy progresses, they develop more and more. So again, uh, this can have a very big impact on your ability to eat. Um, it, you can, it can lead to food aversion. So if it's not pleasant to be eating, it's very difficult to um, continue trying to increase your nutritional intake and can consequently lead to a, a reduced appetite as well, all of which can lead to malnutrition. So the types of dietary strategies that we suggest for taste changes are Really, a lot of it's quite experimental in terms of trying to work out what works for you personally. So if food tastes too sweet or too salty, it's trying no added sugar or salt varieties, for example. Um, experiment with different seasonings, so things like fresh herbs, garlic, honey or ginger, and working out which of those tastes pleasant to you and which of those doesn't work for you. Some of the behaviour strategies are uh, really about keeping your mouth as clean and fresh as possible. So that can help to get rid of anything that might be contributing to a bad taste in the mouth. Drinking water, um, that should say meals, sorry, after meals and snacks to wash away any unpleasant taste. And using a straw, if there's areas of your mouth that you feel are contributing to a poor taste, using a straw to direct food and, um, or drinks, I should say, away from that area of the mouth can really help. Then diarrhoea is one of the other symptoms that can very much affect your nutritional intake or, or certainly lead to malnutrition. And it's commonly associated with a number of, of drugs that might be used with multiple myeloma. And besides the treatment, some of the other risk factors can be being over 65 years of age, um, if you have a low BMI, and having other comorbidities or health conditions, uh, things like diabetes, hypertension, or in particular, inflammatory bowel disease. And diarrhea can affect anywhere from 50 to 80% of people who are going through chemotherapy. And its incidence during immunotherapy and targeted therapy treatments can be quite variable. So again, diarrhea has a, a big impact on food intake and, and absorption. So there can be direct losses from the gastrointestinal tract. So your body's not actually getting the benefit of those nutrients, but also an indirect effect where like with nausea um, and taste changes, it might make you not feel like you want to eat because you don't want to experience the symptom. And, and each of these can lead to malnutrition. So the dietary strategies that we recommend here is drinking enough fluid in particular to avoid dehydration. So that's extremely important. 
avoiding foods that are high in insoluble fibres, so things like whole grain breads, nuts and seeds, uh, raw fruits and vegetable skins. So these can irritate your bowel and, and contribute to diarrhoea. Foods that also can increase um, bowel activity are things that are spicy, fatty or oily foods and caffeine and alcohol. So they're also best avoided. But foods that are low in insoluble fibre, so things like bananas, mashed potato, uh, white rice and pasta and white bread, those sorts of things can be helpful. Um, and also foods that are high in soluble fibres, so things like oats, peeled fruits and vegetables are good things to try. So the last thing I wanted to talk about then was being physically active. Um, I'm not an exercise physiologist or a physiotherapist, so it's not my area, but I just want to touch on how this can really help in terms of, of muscle mass and, and maintaining nutritional status. So being physically active can really help support muscle health. It can reduce risk of muscle loss. Uh, muscle loss is a component of malnutrition, so reducing your risk of muscle loss also reduces your risk of malnutrition. It improves strength, mobility, energy levels, and your ability to do your day-to-day -day activities. And it can really help manage some of the com common symptoms and issues that can be experienced through cancer treatment like fatigue, anxiety, and depression. Um, and I think most of us probably know that it can also improve your appetite as well. So if that's an issue for you, it can be extremely helpful. And it also avoids that detrimental effect that you can experience from a lot of bed rest and sedentary time where uh, muscle loss can occur just because you're, you're spending a lot of time resting as well. A couple of last points I wanted to touch on. So some special considerations during stem cell transplant. So what we tend to find is that most people are well nourished at the time of going um, into hospital for their stem cell transplant, but the impact of the stem cell transplant itself can lead to muscle loss and malnutrition both during and after the admission. So really what your dietitian is trying to do with you at that time is to minimise any weight and muscle loss that occurs during your admission by really helping you to optimise your nutritional intake, managing your symptoms, looking at um, tube feeding if possible, and if you're able to, minimising the amount of bed rest that you're um, having. And then with a real focus on rehabilitation after your admission and, and recovery time following your discharge. And then finally, just touching on infection and antibiotics. So neutropenia, um, I'm sure that's a word that's familiar to many of you, um, and food safety. So uh, really what we recommend is similar recommendations as you would find um, for during pregnancy. So avoiding foods that are associated with a higher risk of foodborne infection, so particularly listeria. Um, really making sure that you use foods before the best before date and practicing good hygiene with washing hands and, and raw foods all very well. And there's a link there to some further information um, as well. And antibiotics, uh, I know um, a speaker prior to me was talking about gut health. Um, it's not an area that I have a lot of experience in. Um, so I've put an, another link there for you on the screen as well, if you're interested, but really uh, as much as possible, eating a wide variety of plant-based foods is what can really help um, optimise your gut health as well. So I think that's all. I hope I've left a bit of time for questions if there are some. Thank you so much, Nicole. It was a really, really comprehensive um, breakdown of a number of strategies that people can use. Um, and I hope that the audience has found it as useful as I have. I think you always learn something new listening to these presentations. Um, a couple of questions. Um, I've got one question which is something that us nurses often get asked and don't quite know how to answer. Um, do you have any recommendations or, I guess, uh, comments on using uh, protein supplements like protein powders or protein fortified foods? They are, you know, very well marketed at the moment and when we're trying to encourage patients to consume more protein often one of the things we hear is that it's challenging for them to logistically and practically mm -hmm. you know increase their meat intake um any any comments on kind of protein fortified things sure yes so uh i mean typically what we do is 
try and um, help people optimise their food intake first. But you're absolutely right. That's not always possible and it can be really challenging. And, and these protein supplements are an excellent source of, of protein, of vitamins, minerals and, and extra energy. So absolutely, um, what we would normally do is, is work with people um, figure out how much they're actually managing to um, get in terms of energy and protein through their food intake and then uh, top up with those types of supplements. And there's a, a wide variety available on the market. You can make homemade versions even with just, um, you know, uh, powdered milk, for example, to fortify mm. normal plain milk Um there, there's many different options and, and yeah, they are, they're, they're very um, often easy way of getting in some additional protein and energy. Yeah, definitely. Um, got a question here from online. Um, someone's curious about um, oral thrush and does mm -hmm. that have any kind of relationship to um, the, 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 you know, our nutritional intake? And I guess um, kind of looking further down the gastrointestinal tract, um, the gut flora in our bowel as well. Is there anything that we should be doing with our um, nutrition to optimise that space there? Sure. Um, and yeah, as I said, gut, gut health is not my area of expertise. So I'm sort of giving you um, as much as I know. But um, I guess things like um, oral thrush, it's you know, it can obviously occur when your immune system is compromised, which often happens obviously through through cancer treatment. Um, and in that situation, it's hard to do a lot to prevent that through mm. diet. So I think, you know, you're obviously having an enormous strain on the body by having the cancer diagnosis and treatment itself. So I think don't put more pressure on yourself to feel like you have to um, be, you know, eating a certain way uh, to, to prevent that. But um, certainly um, we know that gut health is, is improved by plant-based foods in particular. So a really wide variety of plant-based foods optimise gut health. Um, there are other foods... Um, I'm not as, I guess, um, sure how um, well these foods would uh, be tolerated or even um, how good they might be, I guess, during a, a course of chemotherapy. But fermented foods in particular are very good mm -hmm. um, with gut health. But, um, you know, obviously th there's that element of immune-compromised um, situation as well where there's a bit of a balance. So I think discussing that with your health professional is, is extremely important. Probably with oral thrush, though, one of the biggest things is it's very similar to having mouth ulcers or mucositis. It can be really mm -hmm. painful to eat. So um, it, the, the advice that I gave previously with about mucositis and having smooth and bland types of foods also applies in that situation as well. Mm, wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's, as I said earlier, we always learn something and it's been a really, really comprehensive breakdown of, um, you know, the things we can do in our own homes to optimise our nutrition, but also the things we should be asking our health professionals um, for more support in potentially as well. Sure. Thank you so thank much for having me. Thank you. So I'll hand over to my colleague Tash to introduce our third speaker panel. Welcome everybody to the last um, session of this webinar and thank you very much Nicole, that was fantastic. Um, <clears throat> my next two speakers uh, between them have about 35 years of haematology mm -hmm. nursing experience <laughs> um, and they are going to talk about living long term with myeloma. Trish Joyce uh, is nurse consultant with Myeloma and Autologous Transplant Service at Peter Mac uh, VCCC, while Nella is nurse consultant with the Myeloma Service at Peter Mac VCCC. Nella is also project manager with the Australian Cancer Survivors Survivorship Centre. Um, so both of these ladies are well qualified to talk about our next topic of living long term with myeloma. Welcome, Trish and Nella. Thank you. Thanks, Tash. Thanks, Laura. And um, thank you so much for having us here today. Mm -hmm. um, we're we're uh, at Peter Mac today. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's, <laughs> it's been a busy day leading up to a, a long weekend, but we hope that uh, everybody here is able to get something out of the presentation. We have uh, prepared some slides, uh, but we'll also um, talk Keep it fairly informal and casual, and uh, there will be plenty of time at the end for people to ask questions. Yeah. Right. I'll 
just get this internet clicker working. Doesn't seem to be working. Um, is someone is there able to change the slides for us? Thank you. Thank you. So uh, what we would like to cover today in this session is the importance of supportive care in the context of a changing myeloma landscape. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, a clinic that we have um, recently started at Peter Mac called the Living Better with Myeloma Clinic, which is a nurse and pharmacist led clinic. We'll also provide some practical tips to manage symptoms and enhance supportive care, which we hope will be helpful to everybody at home listening in today. We'll talk also about the benefits of early referral to palliative care in symptom management and supportive care for myeloma, as well as the role of other health professionals, your GP and support organisations in supportive care and living well with myeloma. Thank you. So firstly, we'd like to start with uh, what is meant by supportive care. What, what, do, what are we talking about when we use that term? It, it is a bit of a medical term. So we've provided um, a bit of an explanation here on the slide to hopefully bring it into a bit of context and, and you can think about um, this in, in terms of your own experience of living with myeloma. When we're talking about supportive care, we're talking about the prevention and management of adverse effects or un unexpected events, um, effects or side effects of cancer and its treatment. And this is wide reaching. It's not just talking about the physical um, effects of cancer and its treatment, but also psychological symptoms and side effects from across the cancer journey, all the way from diagnosis through to post-treatment care um, and all that's in between. The aim of supportive care is really to improve the quality of uh, rehabilitation, so getting better after cancer and um, or um, during cancer treatment or afterwards, preventing secondary cancers, survivorship, and also end-of-life care. So it's really quite broad. Um, and it's talking about all of the different aspects that contribute to our health and well-being. And it's not just in terms of the person who has myeloma, but also those who are also affected by myeloma, our partners, carers, family and close friends. Great, thanks, Nella. So why do we want to focus on supportive care for our patients, particularly living with myeloma? And we know that there's a lot of research, I guess, out there that tells us, particularly the patients undergoing blood cancers, and particularly, especially people that are living with myeloma, deal with a lot of challenges and that can change during the you know your your journey if you if you want to call it that through the illness experience so at the beginning with your diagnosis there can be the shock um the disbelief that you've got this you know chronic disease um then there may be the pain associated with the disease, the fatigue, and then, of course, we bring you in and start you on treatment. So this study, which was a, a very large cohort, uh, including thousands of patients with blood cancers, but particularly it also included myeloma patients, and it tells us that there's a huge um, broad-ranging um, number of, you know, symptoms and challenges. If you look at the physical, there's the pain, the fatigue, the anorexia, the nausea that's caused by the treatment, um, decreasing your, you know, physical functioning, not being able to do the roles that you once did. And then that can all impact on your psychological well-being and the anxiety that that creates amongst 
the person that's going through the illness, but also, you know, their family and their care. I think mean, that also impacts on, you know, um, your spiritual well-being and, you know, those existential questions that we all ask ourselves and, you know, the meaning and, and why me. So there's a lot of evidence to tell us as healthcare professionals that our patients, you know, living with myeloma particularly are faced with a lot of symptoms. And particularly for myeloma patients, there is a very high symptom burden. And the onus is on us to be able to help you through that. So that's why we really wanted to put that slide up to show you that if you are having a bad day today, you know, there's a good reason for it. And there's lots of evidence out there to say that that's the case, particularly when you're living with myeloma. But also, there's a lot of things that we can do. Um, I might go to the next slide. So we thought we'd take a step back and talk about where we are right now when a person gets newly diagnosed with myeloma. So usually the standard of care here in Australia, is it's slightly different in North America and in Europe, you're either suitable to have a transplant um, in, um, or not. So that's the first question that will be discussed at this point in time. There's lots of exciting treatments ahead, and that's very likely going to change into the future. But right now, that's what we have. And so then the person would have maybe three to six cycles of a combination that you're all probably familiar with, which is Velcade, Revlimid or Lenalidomide, and Dexamethasone. Have stem cell collected, stem cell transplant, and then on to some maintenance treatment. So there'll be variations of that for each person. Um, it's not one size fits everybody. And we like to think that as clinicians, we're able to give really individualized care for each person. But as you go through all of that, symptoms arise, side effects happen. It's not just related to the myeloma itself. It's also the treatment and it's how you react and respond to the treatment. So you can see that arrow that we've put at the bottom of those boxes is defining supportive care. And so supportive care, which we consider is absolutely a priority, goes all the way through from when, you, when we first meet you with the disease um, and you start treatment and all going well, going to a remission and then on to your maintenance part of, of, of your, of your um, therapy. So supportive care will be part, will be the backbone of managing your symptom burden throughout all of that. And I guess, you know, a lot of you on the uh, webinar today, you know, there's lots of different treatments out there. There's lots of very exciting treatments um, coming. Um, and we put that slide up to say there's a whole sort of landscape of changing treatments that you know that will grow and become the new standard of care all of these treatments will have some kind of side effects um and for where you are right now if you know if you are maintenance versus going on to consolidation or even you know your induction so supportive care is really going to be able to manage you know and to treat and help you know, lessen the symptom burden for you as you go through um, whatever treatment you're on. Um, and just on to the next slide. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it and the CVP people are doing it too. So maybe I'll just stop and we'll go back one slide. Please. Thank you. Oh, maybe just forward one. <laughs> oh, no, this is right. Never mind. <laughs> so, um. As um, Trish has mentioned, there are the treatment options for myeloma and the way that we treat myeloma is changing. Um, and it has changed if we reflect back even the last five, 10, mm -hmm. 15 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and we know that people are living longer with myeloma um, and often have periods where they are on treatment for long term and they may go from one treatment to the next treatment without a break. Um, sometimes there are breaks in between. Everybody is different. Uh, but 
there are there's a role for supportive care throughout all the different phases of um, myeloma, the myeloma journey. Mm -hmm. uh, at the and they will change over time, and so priorities will change. And so our role as um, health professionals is to work with you to make sure that at each stage we are trying to address and manage your supportive care needs at that time for what is important to you. What we have, um, what you see here is uh, just the different phases as we kind of have, have tried to conceptualise it. Mm -hmm. And the the one there that we've circled is, um, is the one that we have been focusing on that particular phase um, in the myeloma journey and, the, and our patients who are either on maintenance or have stopped treatment for um, for for a treatment break, mm -hmm. uh, and really trying to take that opportunity while things are um, are stable and um, and focus on enha enhancing supportive care and identifying priorities with um, with patients about how to maximise their health and wellbeing, and we'll talk a little bit more. Uh, in detail about that as we progress through. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Okay. Did you want to talk about this one? Or was I, I can't remember. Yeah, we can talk together. Good. Yeah. I guess this is, um, as we've been talking, um, this is um, another review article, again, just highlighting to us as clinicians because our job is to better look after our patients and to try and improve your quality of life, to help you get from A to B, whatever that part of your journey is. And when I look at a slide like this, I see that we as clinicians could do it so a lot better. And so that's really been the impetus for why Nella and the myeloma team here have um, started this special clinic. It's the supportive care clinic or almost a survivorship clinic. Um, and we can talk a, little, we'll talk a bit more about that. But again, this was another study and it really highlights again how you living with the disease have lots of needs, including physical, emotional, the daily practical stuff, you know, getting in and out of the hospital for your treatments. That can be a major challenge particularly at Peter Mac with all of the roadworks that are currently going on, lots of informational needs. And a lot of these needs are not met by us as clinicians. So I think it's behoven on us as clinicians to think, hey, hang on a second, how can we do this better? How can we improve your quality of life to make the, you know, the, your life living with the myeloma um, as, as, as easy as we can for you? So that's really all what that slide is like is saying, but it's really about just setting the scene about and and the impetus of why we looked at establishing this special clinic. And when um when the researchers who were doing this study were looking at the unmet supportive care needs, the ones in the purple there with the, the circles and the ovals were looking at all people um, with blood cancers, so not just myeloma, but also included lymphoma and leukemia. And then, oh, sorry, I just need to move the mouse. And then um, the ones uh, on the right in the blue boxes were the, were the most frequently reported um, amongst the subgroup of people with myeloma who were included in the study. And since starting, um, working in the survivorship area as well, many of these um, needs are felt by other people and experienced by other people who are living um, with cancer and, and after treatment. However, we know that myeloma is somewhat different in that, that the treatment continues and that people have many lines of treatment. And so, as Trish mentioned, um, there's, a, there's a lot that we can do to support you better. Next slide, please. Yeah. So uh, we wanted to also bring in um, and talk a little bit about how palliative care relates to supportive care and also in the context of myeloma. 
So the inter integration of palliative care in the hospital system is changing. It's most, uh, oh, sorry, it is commonly misunderstood as only appropriate for end of life care. However, this is not the case. Um, as palliative care experts are um, also very, very experienced and and skilled in symptom management and supportive care. And we actually find that um, it is much um, more beneficial to integrate this in as we're delivering supportive care for our patients because they can bring a lot of value to the patient care and the symptom management. Next slide, please. So um, it's funny, palliative care is a funny word and has different connotations for, 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 you know, for all of us. But, um, and it has, it has its origin back in the first hospices that were set up back in the 60s in the United States. Um, but current knowledge and research um, shows that palliative care is 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 important for end of life care, um, but also some very recent research shows that if you use palliative care and introduce that specialist team right at the start of a person's journey with cancer, and it can be any type of cancer, it actually improves patients' well-being. It improves their quality of life. And the specialists that are working in a palliative care team help us as clinicians to manage our patients' symptoms better. So it's all about optimising that person's quality of life, making sure we get control of their pain, manage their nausea better, give them advice around you know, fatigue management. These are all really, um, you know, important elements of a person's, you know, journey with um, myeloma that need to be um, need to be managed and need to be discussed in the clinic and need to be, you know, need, you need to discuss, you know, recommendations. So palliative care now is being introduced much earlier. I might just go back because I haven't gone through the, um, the uh, definition, but this is a nice WHO definition from the World Health Organization. So it's an approach that improves the quality of life of patients and their families who are facing the problem associated with a life-threatening illness through the prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification, assessment and treatment of pain and of course of, of, and of other symptoms. And not just physical, also includes psychosocial and spiritual. So that's why as clinicians and particularly in the myeloma um, landscape, we um, are all, you know, really supporters of introducing the palliative care physicians and specialists um, to meet with our patients much earlier on than we would have, let's say, you know, many years ago. And so the next slide, please. Right, so again, yeah, we were involved in a study here at Pusin Mac called the Care Plus Study. Um, that was that completed last year. It included patients with myeloma and, and their carers, and it looked at the early referral to palliative care um, for newly diagnosed myeloma patients and the benefits. Um, every All of our patients and their carers um, really felt it was beneficial. Um, they knew what it helped them understand what palliative care was and what palliative care offered. Um, some of the patients in that study had just a one-off appointment and then and their symptoms were well managed. They didn't need to um, connect with palliative care again, but they knew that if they did want to, they knew who that palliative care person was. They could ask, could they see, make another appointment to see them? So that can be really empowering for you as a person when you know, okay, you know, I think I'd like to go back to that doctor because he was really good and gave me some really good recommendations and managed my pain really well. So we want to empower you uh, guys. You guys are the experts to help you know 
who you need to call on to help improve your you know your quality of life, manage your symptoms better, because that's really what's so so important as you get through your treatment. So you can remain as well as you can and keep that treatment that treatment cycle on schedule. Yeah, so it's a, it's that holistic approach that palliative care is really all about. Okay. Next slide, please. So now we thought we would talk a little bit about our uh, Living Better with Myeloma Clinic. And we'll then go through some of the elements that we cover in the clinic consultations, which are very, um, very much uh, linked with supportive care mm -hmm. and, and what we've talked about so far. So the aim of our clinic was to establish a nurse-led um, clinic and multidisciplinary, meaning that we also have other people, other health professionals involved in the clinic who are not nurses, such as um, pharmacists and doctors. And it's really for uh, patients who have whose myeloma is in a good remission. Um, they may be on treatment or off treatment, but focusing in on supportive care, health promotion, preventative health and education. Our clinic can be um, delivered or, or held either face-to-face -face or on telehealth. And as I mentioned before, we've got uh, nurses, pharmacists and doctors involved in the clinic at, at certain time points. We identify the supportive care needs and the patient priorities in this clinic with the patients and their carers. Mm -hmm. And that really forms the basis of the care plan that we and the goals that we set. We try to get the pharmacist to see um, the CU or our patients beforehand. And that's usually a telephone call a couple of days or up to a week beforehand to go through current medication, uh, identify any side effects that you might be having with those medications. Um, the pharmacist can also offer um, advice about how to manage medications and, and help our patients um, if they if they have questions regarding their medications and and this this information is really helpful for us to have before the clinic so that we can um, we can focus on other things and and we know that our farm we have a great pharmacist here who who's really really um, really knowledgeable and has made some great recommendations to our patients and then we can also follow up with them in the clinic and see how they're going mm -hmm. with that. Also, I mentioned as well, Nella, that we, we do what we haven't instigated yet, but our plan is also to get our patients to fill out a survey before they come to see us in clinic. And I guess that's important information because uh, it gets them to have a think about what are their priorities of care, but also what are their top sort of um, symptoms of what are the things that are really dragging them down now. So then that gives us some opportunity to get that um, information in a week or two before Nella or I would see the person in clinic so that then we can really have a dedicated, targeted discussion about what those issues are for that person at the time and work to try and um, manage them better. Yeah, yeah. great. Uh, we do have quite a bit of time set aside for these consultations. Um, we only started in November. Um, so we we hope that with uh, as we progress through and we start to see patients coming back to our clinic after three or six months, that um, the consultations will become a bit shorter. Um, but we have the time there to really um, explore the patient's needs um, and take a detailed history of how these different um, side effects, persistent side effects, have been affecting mm -hmm. them. Um, mm -hmm. Because sometimes it's it's we're finding that it's actually the first time that people are, are, are mentioning mm -hmm. some of these side effects as well because um, we have the time to explore them in more mm -hmm. detail and we're prompting for for, um, for discussions about yeah. things that maybe we haven't spoken about before. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes a point I would like to add is 
medical appointments are often very quick and they're very rapid and often as myeloma nurses um, we don't always get the opportunity to sit in with the doctor so that's another reason why this dedicated clinic towards addressing the person's you know supportive care issues or whatever you want to call it and um, also was one of the reasons why we set that up because um sometimes that appointment to see your consultant can be so quick you walk out of the clinic and you think oh my goodness i never asked this this and this so this is really a great way to provide that holistic opportunity to be able to sit down and talk to yeah people in detail yeah. right and now um the the next slides that we're going to go through are different elements that we cover in the clinic it's not it's not everything um but we thought that these would be particularly helpful for for the audience today mm -hmm. to know. And also we hope that it, it provides some, um, some information for you to be able to take back um, to your own healthcare setting, whether it's um, something with your, you might like to um, discuss with your treating team at the hospital or with your GP, mm -hmm. um, because we work, we work very closely with primary care and general practitioners in this clinic too. Uh, so firstly, uh, we have um, a slide here about reducing the risk of infection. We know um, that people with myeloma have um, an increased susceptibility to picking up infections. Um, and and that's, that spans across the whole, um, the whole myeloma experience, even when people are off treatment, even though there may be periods of time where you are more susceptible to infection. It's something that, that, that we do need to be aware of in our patients all the time. Mm -hmm. So we, um, we like to take a bit of a, a, um, a history of, of vaccinations and where people are up to with their vaccinations in this clinic. And um, at the moment, uh, we're just heading into influenza season. So we, we're talking a lot about the seasonal influenza <clears throat> vaccines and, and um, recommending our patients uh, go go and get those as soon as available uh, and keeping up with COVID-19 boosters too. The other thing um, is the Shingrix vaccine is now available on PBS. So a lot of our patients are going back to their GPs to organise those. Mm -hmm. we, sorry, Trish. I just, there's also, we put down there the RSV vaccine. And some of you will be hearing that mentioned maybe even in the news or in different sort of literature and sort of um, social media. Um, it's um, got FDA, it's been approved and it's safe and it's not a live vaccine. RSV is the respiratory syncytial virus. In particularly, it seems to have um, spikes in the winter months. And it can be quite a significant virulent infection. So this is a vaccine to help prevent that. And um, just to point out, um, Atagi has approved it, but it's not PBS approved yet. So unfortunately, you can only get it on a private script. Um, and it's just one dose, but it is expensive currently at the moment. I think it's around about $200. Um, but it's just, it's one vaccine. And I think... Um, it's it's lasts for up to two years. So that might be something you might want to you know consider, or you might want to have a chat with your myeloma specialist doctor about. Um, but yeah, we just put it on there because there's a little bit of you know talk about it now in the community, and I guess as we get deeper into winter, we'll hear about that a little bit more as well. So, but unfortunately, not yet on PBS, but hopefully that won't be too long more before it does. Yeah, right. Um, and then, um, as you can see there, there are a few other things that, that come under the, the infection banner. Um, we can check immuno immunoglobulin levels if they haven't been done recently. Um, our pharmacist usually um, will review what preventative medications, antimicrobial prophylaxis, we didn't change, that's a very medical mm -hmm. term. Yeah, it is. Preventative <laughs> medications for, in, for um, protecting you against mm -hmm. infection as well as ongoing um, education about how to um, keep yourself um, as well as possible. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Next slide, please. 
Oh, sorry, did you want to add something true? I, I guess, you know, um, as Nella pointed out, we're coming into winter, so making sure all of your household contacts as well, that's something that we really now start to, you know, educate our patients and families about. So trying to create a ring of protection for yourself. Um, so that's why we really encourage household contacts as well to get vaccinated. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, bone health is um, also something that we cover in our clinic. We um, we look at um, where people are up to in terms of their bone strengthening medications like Zometa or Permitronate. Um, we um, provide education about the importance of keeping up with daily dental hygiene and regular checkups with your dentist to keep your teeth um, as healthy as possible. And if you need any dental work to make sure that um, our patients check with us first and we can um, make a decision about what to do with their bone strengthening medication in order to get that dental work done. Uh, we can check some blood levels for vitamin D and calcium, um, which are uh, important for bone health. And if they're low, then um, we can work with the medical team to implement some supplementation. Um, as well as, uh, and this crosses over into exercise, which we have um, on another slide, but incorporating weight-bearing exercise into your routine is, is also important for bone health. Um, and so we do talk to our patients about their exercise and how to optimise, make some, um, you know, small changes to, to target uh, weight-bearing exercise if they haven't already got that as part of their exercise routine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, next yeah. slide, please. So in our clinic as well, there's a, a good or a big focus on preventing other um, illnesses and diseases. Um, and that's the, one of the reasons for that is that we know that anybody that has had a cancer and cancer treatment, they will have a slightly increased risk. And that's very small of developing a secondary cancer down the track. Um, so it's good to know that. But the important thing is that we have really good screening programs in place. And one of the focus for our clinic is to make sure we discuss that with our patients, um, particularly our patients, you know, that have been on treatment and now on their maintenance and doing very well. You know, they're back doing normal things and back at work. Sometimes with the tyranny of the busyness of everyday life, we forget about little things like this, and these are really important. So there's excellent screening programs for bowel, skin, breast, cervical, and prostate. And so much of our time as well in the clinic is discussing why these are important, um, why it's important to follow the national recommendations for cancer screening for the various sort of diseases such as colorectal cancer, skin cancers, breast, cervical cancer and prostate. So I think it's um, often, you know, scary to hear that, especially when you're going through one cancer, you don't want to get another one. But I think be reassured and feel empowered that a screening program is that. It's to help keep you healthy, keep you safe, and to pick up on things early where we can, you know, do something that's, you know, with little intervention. So that's a very important part of our clinic as well. And then we work with the GP um, because your GP is a really important person in your care. And we have, we communicate the the discussion that we have with the patient in our clinic with the GP, but checking other elements of your health, such as, you know, monitoring your blood glucose, um, monitoring your cholesterol levels and your lipid profile, just making sure that we reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease, um, checking your thyroid function, which is important after various types of treatment, all with a focus of keeping you healthy and identifying things early on where we can do something really meaningful to manage it um, very straightforward for the person. So the focus is on, you know, education, 
keep, you know, making sure that you understand what, you know, elements of health screening you need to undertake and, and putting a plan in place for that. And then it's all about a healthy lifestyle as well. Um, it's about, you know, making sure that you try and if you are a smoker, that you stop smoking because of the benefits to your health. Um, you know, a healthy approach to alcohol intake um, and also recreational drugs. So these are all sort of elements that we discuss in, you know, they're important for a healthy lifestyle for all of us. But yeah, it's, um, and we feel that in this clinic, it gives a good, you know, gives time to be able to address those things for our patients in, in a bit more detail. Next slide, please. Another aspect of our clinic um, is uh, around uh, sexual health and intimacy. So we, we always take some time um, to discuss this with our patients uh, and we're very much guided by um, how comfortable people are talking about this. But we want to create a safe place where people can talk about their sexual health and intimacy and bring up any um, any questions that they have or concerns. Some of the concerns um, that we have been um, that have been brought up so far are um, re re listed there. So decreased libido, erectile dysfunction, vaginal dryness, uncomfortable or painful intercourse, and relationship problems. Now um, we know that all of these things can impact various aspects of somebody's health and well-being and um, not just physically and emotionally but also socially too uh, and are important aspects of us feeling healthy and good and, and living living well. So whenever we, we um, identify one of these concerns in our clinics, we are able to refer people on for management and support and we've got some really great clinics here um, at Peter Mac. Um, but we also have other um, other supports through communities mm. and through GPs mm -hmm. as well. So um, we want, I suppose, for people listening in today, um, this is definitely something that you can discuss with your treatment team. It's not something that you have to um, that you have to just deal with or accept as part of, mm -hmm. of, of as a long term side effect of treatment or something that that. Um, that you're still experiencing, and we we want um, we want to know if if this is a problem. And so, if you if you are um, experience any intimacy or sexual health related issues um, because of your cancer or, or treatment, um, please bring them up with one of your doctors mm -hmm. or nurses. Yeah, I agree, Nella. It's it's an underreported concern that patients report. And I think that's precisely because we as clinicians maybe don't create that right environment or ask the right questions. But as you said on the slide, there are so many things that we can offer the person to be able to manage, you know, all of those concerns that are on, on that slide. Um, and again, can, you know, can really improve, you know, your well-being and feeling, you know, better about yourself. Next slide, please. Okay, hey, so emotional health and mental health. Um, so it's it's um it's a marathon, isn't it? Living with um um a myeloma um diagnosis. Um, the the good news is that you know the the, the you know as Nella said at the start, the treatment landscape is changing. You know the outcomes are improving. We've got a lot of exciting treatments to come, and we've made so much progress in how we manage a press, you know this disease up to this point in time. But that's not to take away that you know it's very up and down. We understand that there's so many challenges along the way, from and those challenges can be different depending on where you are in your journey. Um, from the you know the shock of diagnosis to the fear uh, is it going to relapse if you've gone into a remission it's about how you manage that uncertainty and I guess that slide is you know that they're you know showing all different ranges of emotions you know frustration anger sadness 
question, you know, and we know that there are so many challenges that a person can, you know, be, um, face um, along the way that contributes to, you know, how, you know, how you manage your mental health. I think it's a very important part of, um, of looking after you. I think our physical and our mental well-beings are so intertwined that, you know, it's, you know, we have, we have to take a holistic approach. So it's something that we discuss with our patients all the time. Physically, you know, it's a focus in the clinic, but it's about trying to, you know, um, talk about how you're feeling, how your well, mental health is going. Um, and talk about, you know, what kind of supports that we can put in place. And there are lots and lots of places that you can seek support from. I think, I think really the first thing is, you know, just, you know, putting your hand up and saying, you know, I am having a tough time. And that's really, really okay. And, you know, and just normalizing that anybody going through, you know, um, a cancer journey do face, you know, challenging moments. GPs are great. Um, uh, they are a really great resource. Um, you know, and if you don't have a GP, we would strongly encourage you to get one. Um, um, talking to your GP, setting up a chronic healthcare plan is really important where you can access some specialist um, care or specialist consultations, such as a psychologist, which can be subsidized. So they can be really helpful um, for you. And then, of course, we've got the wonderful Milo in Australia, and you know the support groups that are um, um that are out there that you can access, and that peer discussion, and that sort of net, you know, uh, that close contact with people who are going on a similar journey, can be really invaluable to share, you know, your how you're feeling, and know that somebody else going through the same journey is feeling exactly the same way. So again, it's important to, you know, to let your, you know, your treating doctor know, your treating nurse know, because there's lots of supports out there. And it is a very normal thing to feel lots of those emotions that are kind of that are shown on the screen. Next slide, please. Um, I don't think we need to spend too much time talking about sleep and um and the effects of myeloma, its treatment on sleep. Um, because we probably all know that very, very well. Um, so what we do want to um, highlight to you, though, is a really great resource um, there that's on the, on the screen, a booklet. Um, if you are still having sleep problems, whether you're on treatment or not, um, it, there are some there's some really great information um, in the CAN Sleep booklet there which can be downloaded um, via the Peter Mac website uh, and we, with lots of practical strategies and help and, it, and it's applicable to anybody. Doesn't matter, you don't have to be a, a patient at this hospital. Um, recommend that you have a look and see if there's anything there that can help you. Next slide, please. Um, physical activity is something that we also talk about on in our clinic. Um, we we recommend that our patients be as physically active as their current condition allows. And, and we try and work with them to um, set some goals around exercise as well and, and enhancing their exercise, um, either the time that they spend exercising or the type that they do. We, a lot of people find that they, um, they want to exercise, but there are limitations. Um, and so we can also refer to physiotherapists and exercise physiologists or, or ask the patients to organise those through their GP um, to get that expert input. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. um, this slide is talking about kidney health um, and um, some people living with myeloma can have some kidney impairment or their kidneys may not be working as well as they should normally, and that information would be known to you and discussed with between you and your doctor. I think for even people that don't have any kidney impairment, looking after your kidneys is so important because we know that when particularly myeloma is active, um, the actual protein itself can sometimes damage the kidney. So 
really good way to think about your kidneys is they're two big filters and you need to flush them well. Um, and so kidney fun you know, keeping up a good fluid intake, really important. Your doctor will be having a discussion with you and certainly in our clinic, we will be discussing the um, blood results to um, let um, the person know what their kidney function is doing. And that's an important question you can ask your doctor. If you do have kidney impairment um, or your kidneys are a little bit stressed and you know that, 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 that that's what they've been like, it's really important that you avoid, you know, certain medications or, you know, um, IV contrast that we use for some scans. So these are important things to avoid, particularly um, drugs, it's a mouthful, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, but drugs like neurofin, and I'm sure you would have known that, but it's really important that you stay clear of those kind of drugs. Um, some over-the-counter supplements are absolutely fine, but some can sometimes, because we're not quite sure what's in them. So really important, again, that's something we would discuss with our patients and take, you know, with our pharmacists on board in the clinic and um, find out, you know, what are there any elements in those supplements that could potentially, you know, cause the kidneys to get stressed more. And then, of course, you're all on probably what we call a bisphosphonate or a bone strengthener called Zometa. The other name is Pimitronate. Um, and monitoring your kidney function are a really important part of um, um, of uh, prior to any dose of the metaclinic, depending on the frequency you're having it. Yeah, so next yep. slide. Okay. Yep, and um, pain and neuropathies um, can persist um, long-term um, or fluctuate over the course of um, myeloma journey. And these can be um, the nerves, the motor, sensory, or autonomic nerves affected, the motor being the ones that control movement um, of your body, sensory ones, um, picking up sensations and, and sending them from the external world, sending them to the brain for processing, and, and that's how you feel them. Um, and autonomic um, are less talked about. They're the, they're the nerves that control our, um, our sort of internal functions, like our digestion and our um, our sexual organs as well. So um, Myeloma Australia actually have a, a wonderful resource called Managing Peripheral Neuropathy, um, which covers all the different um, types of neuropathy as well. So if you haven't already had a look at that, really recommend you have a look via their website. Um, it's um, if you are experiencing any sort of nerve um, sensations or, or any of these funny feelings or problems with your digestion um, or blood pressure, let your doctors and nurses, your treating team know. Um, they might need to change some things, mm -hmm. um, some medications if they are actually contributing to those symptoms. Uh, there are some treatments um, that are available. Some can be medications or other strategies and uh, referral to a specialist um, neurologist may be indicated as well as um, pain and palliative care teams um, can be really beneficial for people who have ongoing pain or, neuropath or neuropathy too. Next. We're conscious we're coming to, we've gone over a little bit, but we're nearly at the end. So just bear with us. We've just got a couple of more slides to go. Next slide, please. Um, yep. So this is your care team. And um, so, you know, it's all about trying to set yourself up with a team of people that's on your case to help you and support you, you know, through, through you know, the, the, your journey with, with myeloma. Um, so getting a GP, having a GP is really important. Making sure you're comfortable with that GP. Um, with the um, interface with our clinic and when we see our patient, we always give them a copy of the care plan that we discussed with the patient. Um, that gets sent to the patient as well as the GP. And then any follow-up um, elements of the person's care that can be done locally, we will always um, document and communicate that on the care plan and on, um, on the letter that's sent to the GP. So, for example, things like when their next vaccines are due, 
any medication changes, any medication suggestions, um, what we discussed about the cancer screening plan for the person at the time, monitoring for other um, diseases such as diabetes, um, cardiovascular disease. So all of that is documented in that plan. Um, and patients anecdotally have fed back to us that they feel that it's a very comprehensive um, and they actually, you know, like the fact that um, there's really clear good communication between the treating myeloma centre and the GP. And also if we have, we will also document in the care plan if we refer that person to another um, specialist um, in, in, in the, um, the centre. And then um, next slide, please. And then finally, um, your care team also includes other um, health professionals like allied health. Uh, and specialists like Trish has just mentioned, we may um, we may include and refer on to cardiology or uh, if someone has a problem with their heart or respiratory, if they're having lung problems or neurologist for nerves. Uh, community organisations such as Myeloma Australia offer an amazing amount of support. There's only so much um, that the hospital can provide often and, mm -hmm. and GPs and um, we can't, uh, stress enough the important role that these organisations have in um, in living well with myeloma and maximising supportive care. So please take the opportunity to explore all of the offerings of all of the organisations because they're there to help you mm -hmm. um, and they have excellent resources and amazing staff, as, as you know. Yeah. That brings us um, to the end of our talk. Thank you. Um, so much. We'd love to answer any questions or hear any <laughs> suggestions or any comments. <laughs> Thanks, Trish and Nella. That was um, really enriching and um, I certainly lost learnt a lot. We've probably got time for one question, which is quite important. Is it... Um, are patients able to self-refer to palliative care? That's a very good question, Tash. Um, and if they, I think they would need a doctor's referral, as in by the GP. And certainly if they wanted to do that, let's say they were a patient at Peter Mac and they wanted to access a palliative care physician here, of course, they would be absolutely, they can come and speak to one of us. We would need to do the formal kind of referral pathway. Um, but I would think, Nella, that, that you could do it in the community as well by a GP. Um, but it probably would, I think you have to think about how it would work best for the patient. So I think the patient, where the person is having their treatment, it would be, optimal for that person to be linked in with a palliative care physician within that centre so that there's really good communication back and forth. Um, sometimes even now, Nella and myself will sit in with the palliative care doctor when they're seeing one of our patients. And I think that's critically important so that we're both, we've got the person in front of us we're, both, we're coming from slightly different disciplines, but the goal is to improve symptom management and optimise that patient's quality of life. So I would say that it would be best done within the centre that the person's having their treatment. And 100%, if that's what that person feels they need, they just need to, to talk to their doctor and their nurse. But yeah, we do have anything yeah. else. No, I think you covered that, that really well, Trish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds fabulous. And I love the the discussion of the teams communicating with one mm -hmm. another. And mm -hmm. I love your your group's um plan for the GP because I think that's something that's um that's really lacking in our general community. So some some great ideas for our patients to take back to their their usual treating centres. Thank you very, very much for taking time out of your very busy day. Um, 
Laura and I realised just this week that we put this session into Easter week and <laughs> all health professionals are really, really busy in the short week. Um, so we really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. You're very yeah. welcome. Yeah, thank you so much yeah. for having us. Again. Yes, exactly. It's been a real privilege. Thank you again. Um, so I hope that you enjoyed today's webinar, the aim of which was to provide some tools for self-empowerment. And I think we can all agree that we've had some fabulous speakers and I hope that you've gained something from them. We would love to receive any feedback and that can be done by completing the evaluation form at the bottom of this page. That brings us to the end of a mammoth National Myeloma Month, or it feels so for me. The crew at Myeloma Australia have been overwhelmed by the way our community, and that's you, have come together in support of the organisation and yourselves. I personally feel greatly honoured to be part of it. I'd like to thank our sponsors without whom much of this could happen. As most of you know, Myeloma Australia doesn't receive any government funding and relies on fundraising and grants to keep operating. So we are very grateful to those sponsors. A big shout out to the National Myeloma Month webinar crew, Joe Gardner, Kath Bowley, Lucy Murphy, and especially Laura Jones, who did most of the heavy lifting. And finally, as always, a huge thank you to our production company, CVP, who make all of this work so seamlessly. Happy Easter, everyone, and we'll see you next year. Bye.